from the drive and this is part five of asking our neighbors what makes a good neighbor. Do you mind if we ask you a question for a video we're making? All right, in your mind, what makes a good neighbor? Oh, one who's not too noisy. A neighbor who's not too noisy, thank you so much. I love your bike. <laughs> in your opinion, what makes a good neighbor? Well, engaging with your neighbors, spending a little time with them, looking out for them, uh, trying to draw them into uh, a relationship. Awesome, thank you so much. What makes a good neighbor? If you're quiet, mind your business, and only be friendly when asked. Oh, we love it. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> well, good morning. Hey, uh, my name is Josh, and I'm the pastor here at Church on the Drive. If we haven't met yet, I would love to get to know you right after service. If you're up for that, I, just, I won't like ask you all a bunch of personal information or anything. I just want to get to know you and, and say hi. And if you want to get coffee or something like this week or next, let, let's do that. Um, you're here on a great Sunday. If this is your first Sunday or second Sunday, it's a great one because today we're finishing up our series that we've been calling Like a Good Neighbor because uh, we think it's important. We think it's imperative to the life of every follower of Jesus to know what a good neighbor is. And in a practical sense, like if, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, it's very important to know what a good neighbor is like because good neighbors make great neighborhoods. If you want to live in a great neighborhood, you got to be the type of good neighbor that creates that environment. But in a spiritual sense, I mean, Jesus looked at his followers. He looked at people around him and said, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So we want to be really good neighbors. And when it, when, I, when it comes to thinking about good neighbors, one of the things I always look back to and think back to is uh, right at the start of the pandemic. You remember those days? Like those, that first you know, two weeks to, to a month where nobody knew what was happening. The world was shutting down. Everything was, was different. Everything was confusing. Um, you couldn't go anywhere unless you were like in the medical field and then you had to show up or then you had to go there if you were in certain jobs. But most people, you're just trying to stay put for the most part. You remember what it was like, the way that our whole society just decided that we were going to be for each other that we weren't going to be at each other's throats, that we weren't going to be talking about how divided we needed to be, and we need, you were this, I'm this, I'm the smart one, you're dumb, everybody who believes like me is smart, everybody who believes like me votes this way, thinks this way, talks this way, worships this way, you go, looks this way, and, and the rest of y'all are just wrong and evil. Instead, we decided that no matter what might be different about us, that we were going to be for each other that we were going to look for ways that we could be united, that we could be there for other people. I mean, I, I still remember standing out in my front yard as the teachers and administration from Lake Silver Elementary came through my neighborhood and with all their cars, and they had put signs on their cars, and they had written uh, in shoe polish on there like a little homecoming parade of their own, and they're just honking and waving. And I mean, every teacher in the school seemed to have done it because there were a million cars, and I had a baby trying to sleep. But, and they're honking. But it was... It was it was moving to me because I watched them. They came and, and they're honking and they're waving to kids who had come out of their houses to see their teachers. They sent these emails and texts to all their families. And all they were doing was trying to lay eyes on kids to make sure that them and their families were okay. They had chosen to be for their students and their students' families when it would have been really easy just to stay holed up somewhere. I, I think about how our city did the same thing with the an Easter parade. I stood on the front steps of this church and watched that one too. And you can think of other times you saw the same thing. Maybe you're like me and you watched around the world, even here in America, but all around the world where people who lived in apartment buildings around hospitals, when they knew when shift change was and when the doctors and nurses came walking out of those hospitals you remember what those, those videos showed? The people in those apartment buildings had all gotten together somehow and communicated and connected and said, when they walk through those doors that shift change, we are going to bang our, pox, our pots and pans. We're going to clap. We're going to sing. We're going to do all of this stuff to tell them that they are appreciated and valued and loved. They chose to be for the doctors and the nurses and the anesthetists and hospital workers of all types. That was a beautiful, beautiful thing. It wasn't perfect. I mean, it was a season of confusion, but it was an opportunity that a lot of people took 
to see some beauty in the world and to make good things happen. Others, though, saw it as the end of the world. (laughs) They saw it as the world was ending. And I can't blame them because the events of the last few years, when you really think about it, they've been nothing short of apocalyptic, have they? They've been apocalyptic. I mean, you couldn't write this this, this, this script in Hollywood. You couldn't write it, except people already kind of have in some way. You ever remember that movie Contagion? Somebody gets a virus and starts spreading, and next thing the world's going crazy. Uh, Remember Walking Dead? People are getting sick, and and then everybody's a zombie. Good thing we didn't see the zombies. That would have been bad, right? Then it would have really gotten weird. But it's been this apocalyptic event. And so when other people saw this apocalyptic event happening, they said, look, it's the end of the world. Everything's going crazy. We're living in the last days. Jesus is returning soon. And I recognized that that feeling early on because I grew up in a faith tradition uh, that thought exactly that way, thought exactly that way, that the world was ending at any given moment. In fact, if I were to leave here, drive to one of their houses, I haven't seen many of them in years haven't had a conversation with many of them in years, but I would be willing to bet you, unless something big has changed in their life, that when I sat down with them and talked to them for a little bit, part of the conversation we would have would, would have them saying this, living in the last days, Josh, better make sure you're living right so you can go with the Lord when he returns. Maybe you've heard something similar. Oh man, my whole life, the, the Lord is returning soon. We're living in the last days. I can remember being a kid and, and hearing a prophetess uh, who came to our church to, to preach a revival. She got up, and I can remember her in one particularly emotional time in the service go, y'all, the prophets aren't seeing anything past 2004 or 2006. Now, mind you, this is like 1997, 1998, and I'm, I'm sitting there in seventh grade just, Whoo! what's going to happen? I don't know what to do with that. But I've been hearing all my life that uh, we're living in the last days, and I just happened to be born at that time where I was going to see it. In this. Now, on, on this side of things, as an adult and somebody who's got a degree in history and went to seminary and has studied some of the, the passages that they've gleaned all of this from, I, I can look back and go, well, y'all been saying that your whole life and it hadn't happened <laughs> And uh, your moms and dads were saying that before. So let, let's, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Now, I, I do think we need to live with expectancy that Jesus is returning, that we need to live like Jesus could and, and should and, uh, return at any moment because he said he would come like a thief in the night. But I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified. I, I didn't know what to li- do with that because every time there was a war, every time there was a famine or a drought or a hurricane or a tsunami or something like that, They would look and they'd say, ah, look, it's right there in Revelation. Ah, look, it's right there in Matthew. That's what Jesus is talking about. I remember one time they they pointed to a specific verse in in, uh, Revelation. And they said, look, John is talking about here in Revelation, he's talking about locusts. And they said, obviously he's talking about military helicopters. They didn't have a word for helicopters back. They had no con, but they knew what giant locusts were. And I said, that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. It was terrifying. And it just so happened that I also lived at the turn of the millennium, like many of you, right? And, and so in 1999, you're hearing about this thing called Y2K. And the world is supposed to end at Y2K. Like at the stroke of midnight in the year 2000, all the computers are going to stop working. Lights are going to turn off. People are going to die in the cold. It's going to be awful. And like... You just imagined the purge was going to start taking place right then. So I remember January 31st, 1999, I was at my grandparents' house. And I remember just staying up all night with my grandfather. And I'm scared. He's trying to talk me down. He's like, son, it's going to be fine. You're you're a follower of Jesus. You're a Christian. Like, if the Lord returns, you're going too. And I said, yeah, but what if I'm not holy enough? And I'm freaking out. And... You know, we're trying to watch the, the dropping of the ball in New York, and they're just playing, like, party like it's 1999 all the time. Prince is everywhere, right? I love, I like, still love that song. It's great. But, I mean, that was, like, the day that that song was made for. And, like, I hear, every time I think of it, I, I remember all of the anxiety I had on that day. I was like, oh, man, that was serious. 
because we thought the world was ending. Now, couple that with all the stuff I've been hearing my whole life and that 2,000 seems like a nice round number for the Lord to return on. And you hear about millenniums and Jesus and you're like, oh, okay, it's changing and how do we work this? It was kind of, kind of terrifying because they said, look, there are persecutions coming. Now, many of them believed that the Christians in America were already being persecuted. They believed that we were already losing our rights and that this was happening and people were coming after us and we couldn't pray in schools and now God is going to get us and all of this stuff and, and, and now this is happening and that's happening and the world is getting worse and worse and worse and we're being persecuted. Now, maybe you're like that still. You think to yourself, like, no, we are being persecuted in America. And if, and if that's you, maybe you're right. But let me offer this. There are there are people in the world who call themselves followers of Jesus who have to worship in the dark, not because they have cool lights in a smoke machine like we do, <laughs> but because if they turn the lights on and if they sing a song too loud, the authorities will come in and arrest every single one of them and take them to a work camp. There are Jesus followers around the world in different places They've got to be careful who they let know that they're a Jesus father. They've got to be careful how they live and, and what they say and where they say it and, and who they trust with certain information because they could at any moment be dragged out of their home and killed in front of their family for being a follower of Jesus. There are people who lose jobs, who are taxed a different amount because they're followers of Jesus. Now that, in my mind, is actual persecution. Sure, America, the West has changed and it's become less and less... Um, Christian, if you want to say that. If, less and less people identify as Christians to this day. And so as we've made room for those people within our society, uh, we've had to give up a little bit, right? A little bit of, of, of a majority stakeholder approach to things. I don't know that we're necessarily persecuted in the same way that our friends around the world are feeling persecuted. In fact, we've kind of got it pretty easy, don't we? we? We get to gather here. We don't have to hide anything. We can be as loud as we want. Uh, we can have it a broadcast online to people around the world, and they're watching. Hi, glad you're watching too. Glad you're here with us. We can do all of this without any fear that somebody's going to hunt us down and do something to us. But there's followers all over the world who are feeling persecuted. And you know what? Sometimes I think it's healthy for us to, to begin to wonder, what would it be like if we were in their shoes? What would it be like if suddenly we couldn't meet like this? If suddenly you and I had to be very careful what we said to who and told where we were going on what days? What would it be like if we knew people who were dragged from their homes and beaten in front of their families for being a follower of Jesus? What would it be like? Would our churches be as full? Would our uh, congregations be as full? Would a member list of congregations be as full? Not a chance. I don't think so at all. Because there's a lot of people that want to sit on the fence with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And those people, I think, by and large, would largely just head over here to the world. It's going to be tough to be a real follower of Jesus if you're being persecuted. And that's exactly what was happening to the early followers of Jesus in Rome. And the reason is because in the year 64, there was this Roman emperor you may have heard of named Nero. Nero was tough. By all accounts, he was a sadistic, psychopathic leader, one of the worst in recorded history. He did things that would make your skin crawl, things I won't repeat, but some of them I will because I want you to know the severity of the persecution. In the year 64, Nero allegedly set the city of Rome on fire. Now, there's people who say, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Nero. It, it, somebody, it just happened. Or, uh, but let me say this to you. Two of the only estates that didn't get burned in that great fire in Rome were Nero's and the estate of Nero's lover. That's an odd coincidence. 
Everybody else at the time thought so too, and they, they were blaming Nero. There was even reports that Nero was playing his violin as Rome burned. We don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds like him. And so they, they came up and said, hey, Nero, we know you did this, we know you did this. And he knew really quickly he needed to get the people back on his side. And the only way he could get the people back on his side, he had to come up with a scapegoat. And he needed the perfect scapegoat. Somebody who wasn't powerful enough to do anything to him, but somebody everybody believed could have made it happen. And so he thought, and he thought. He said, well, what about the Jews? There are people who have been persecuted forever. And even since Rome, they've been persecuted. They said, well, 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 let's hold on. That, there's a sizable, sizable group of them here in Rome. And, and actually, a lot of people kind of like them here in Rome. And your mistress, Nero, is actually one of, a, a patron of many Jews here in Rome. He goes, yeah, we can't do that. And they have, you know, religious legal protections and stuff like that. But what about that crazy group of them, the one they're calling the Christians? The Christians, by this point in the 60s, had, uh, they'd grown a little bit, and they'd gotten to Rome, and they had kind of removed themselves more and more from Jewish life. The, the Orthodox Jews had, had quit hanging out with them as much and didn't trust the Christians anymore. That was the perfect scapegoat. And so Nero went around killing them and, and, and maiming them and hurting them. There's reports that he uh, would feed them to wild animals in the Colosseum so, so that uh, people would see and laugh and have a good time. It was so widespread that, that this was a very normal thing. Nero would even round them up and kill them, place their bodies on poles in his garden, and at night would light the bodies on fire so that he could walk through his gardens at night. That's persecution. That's what they were dealing with. They were the perfect minority group. And Nero went all the way. In the middle of this, Jesus' right-hand man, a guy you might re remember, a, a man named Peter, Peter was leading this church in Rome by this point. And he's undergoing and, and dealing with all of these persecutions. Uh, Peter actually eventually dies and is martyred in Rome himself. He's dealing with all of these persecutions, and he pens a letter. And he writes this letter to churches in Asia. Well, more specifically, Asia Minor. I, want, I brought a map just to show you. So Asia Minor is over here in modern-day Turkey, all right here. Rome way over here. You'll notice this is Greece right here. Now there is, uh, up, up here outside of the map, there's, uh, there's land that connects Rome and Greece. But this is the connecting point here, right here. This is the connecting point for Asia to Europe. This is also Asia Minor, an area where there was a lot of emperor worship. There was a cult of the emperor out there in Asia, Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Lycia, and Cilicia. Now, there's a few reasons for that. Number one, they needed somebody to worship. Uh, number two, it was good business to worship the emperor and flatter the emperor and anybody in the emperor's court, especially if you wanted good roads going through your area. Why does that matter? Because if Rome's empire had extended all the way over here and down in here, which it had, you wanted the roads that were going to provide that for you. So if you were flattering the emperor all the way over here and he heard about how you worshipped him and you did all these things for him and you were committed to that, and if the generals and the Roman military soldiers and everybody made sure that you were committed to that, you had a good name. They were more likely to do that for your town and for your region. This was a stronghold. Asia Minor was a stronghold for emperor worship in the ancient world in the 60s. So over here in Rome, Peter puts two and two together, we think, and he says, look, it's going to happen there too. This persecution is going to happen all the way in Asia Minor too. I need to tell him to get ready because there weren't as many Christians in Asia Minor. And if things start to falter in Asia Minor, you might be locked out of there for a while. There may be zero Christians after a while. I need to tell them how to live as followers of Jesus undergoing persecution. I need to tell them how to live. 
so that they know what to do. This is one of the reasons that the book of 1 Peter, this letter I'm talking about that we call 1 Peter, is so well loved by the persecuted church around the world because it tells them how they can live, how they can have hope, what they should be doing. Peter writes to them and he says, hey, listen, I want you to live like people of God. I want you, no matter what the persecution is, I want you to live like God really and truly lives in your heart. I want you to live in this way that mystifies the rest of the world. And he lists all of that out. Make sure that you're kind to others. Make sure you're listening to other people. Make sure um, that you're doing what's right. And towards the end of his letter, he gets there and he says this. He says, the end of all things is near. Now, when we read that, a lot of times we, we read that and go, oh, there's Peter predicting the end of the world. But not necessarily, because the word in Greek here that's used for end is more like a, a time or a, a, an era, a, a phase even. The end, the, the, this end phase is near. Kind of the, the end phase that we're until the last thing that happens. So the end phase is this last phase before the end point. And for Peter and for the early church, the end point was the return of Jesus. So Peter's saying that end phase is near. So you need to be living like it. You need to be living like it. So as followers of Jesus, uh, one of the ways that we can put that is we can talk about um, the presence of the future. There's a great book. Um, it's an old one now, but it's by a guy named George Eldon Ladd called The Presence of the Future. It really helps me in this. If you're into reading books on these subjects, I would recommend that one to you. We talk about it in terms of the, the presence of the future, uh, that uh, we're living as if it is already, but not yet. Right? So we're, we're saying uh, the end point is Jesus and Jesus returns and then everything is exactly as God wants it. The kingdom of God is fully realized on earth. We are going to live currently as if that future is a reality already. We're going to live as if that future is present with us and in us. That's coming. And so he takes the next few lines to explain what he means by that. He says this, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So we are going to start with love. We're going to start with looking at everything through the lens of love, operating through the lens of love. You've heard me say it before, but I'll say it again. I believe everything comes down to one of two emotions, that you're operating out of one of two emotions, love or fear. Love or fear. He says, we're going to operate out of love. That's how you operate in the kingdom of God. We see examples of that with Jesus, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus came out of love, not out of fear, not out of a need for you to glorify him, not out of a need for anything like that, but out of love. God came to save you and to save me. So we start with love. In everything that we do, if we're going to live as if the future is already present with us, we start with love. So maybe I, I can rephrase what we're looking at here. Um, if you'll indulge me for a second, maybe we'll just put it this way. What does love require of me? In everything that I do, in every interaction I have or don't have, what does love require of me? When your kid is screaming at 4.30 in the morning because they wet the bed, what does love require of you? When that boss who is so annoying and so inept gets on your nerves again and again and again and gives you a terrible project and talks about you poorly to other people who work with you. What does love require of me? When your family doesn't understand why you do the things you, that you do and they question everything that you do and they think they know how to parent your kids better or do this or that better, what does love require of me? Sometimes it means I don't talk to those people. Sometimes, though, it means I take a beat. I pause and I take a moment. Or it means I respond to that email a day later. You've got to figure that out. But we're operating through the lens of love. He goes on. 
It says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, maybe you're like me. You're not a super, I don't really get hospitality. You know what I mean? Like some people, you go over to their house and there's like 15 different types of candy and hors d'oeuvres out already, right? They have 17 charcuterie boards lined up and it's just you coming over, right? It smells nice. It's all clean. It, I mean, it's just immaculate. You know, you know those people. I'm not those people. I, I'll clean it up. I'll make sure that, you know, there's beef jerky out for you or something like that, but it's about as far as we're going. I just don't think like that. That's not exactly what he's meaning here, although I think it would be included. He's meaning put people up for the night. Remember, this is the time when hotels didn't really exist. You didn't go to a new town and then like there's a hotel or uh, you didn't have your house burned down and then you stayed at a hotel for a few weeks until something else happened. You needed the hospitality of strangers and, in this case, Christians to help you through. Christians were known for this level and this type of hospitality. They were also known for hospitality when it came to having places to meet and places to study the word of God together and have their worship time together where they would go and they would sing songs. Well, in an era where there's great persecution, guess what might make you grumble a little bit? Having 30 people over at your house talking about Jesus because that puts your house as a marked location and you start getting scared for your family. So I can imagine somebody might grumble a little bit, but Peter says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I wonder what that might look like. If we're talking about this is, this is what it looks like in the kingdom of God, what that might look like in your life on your neighborhood. How you might offer hospitality to somebody in your neighborhood without grumbling. Well, he kind of lines this out a little more in the next verse. He says, look, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various form. Now, there's a lot going on there, so let's break it down. So whatever gift you have received, that, that's a lot of different things. Like that can be your time. That can be uh, your money. That can be other resources you have, like your home, your car. Your abilities, some of you, you are really, really good at connecting with other people. And yet you've never had a single conversation with anybody about the faith you say you have. Why is that? What Peter would say is, use that gift. Use your ability to connect with you to have those conversations. Why? Because then you're a faithful steward of God's grace. You're a faithful steward of God's grace. Now, maybe you've been given this this uh, grace gift of having a lot of money. Like you, you've just been a talented person in the right industry and God blessed you. And by all accounts, you are wealthy. What are you doing with that? Are you blessing other people with that? Are you leveraging those funds to make sure that other people are blessed? I know a lot of people. Some are poor, some are rich, some are somewhere in the middle. And I know a lot of wealthy people who are doing exactly that. They're using the gifts God has given them to make sure that poor people have medical care, to make sure that poor people aren't starving. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Peter's talking about. Use whatever gift you have received to serve. He's not just talking about spiritual gifts, although those are included too. Whatever gift, because these gifts come in various forms. And then he says this, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. So we're using our gifts to serve others. Whatever gifts we have, how, no matter how big, no matter how small, we're using whatever gifts we have. If your only gift is you know how to work a broom, you can use that gift to the glory of God. But maybe you're a great orator. Maybe you're great in conversation. You should do that as one who speaks the very words of God. Every time you speak, are you lifting people up or are you tearing people down? It's real easy to tear people down. Sometimes it's really funny too. Let's be honest. Peter wants you to lift other people up as if you are speaking the very words of God to other people. That's how serious this is. If you're going to live in the kingdom of God, 
Then in Peter's mind, uh, you need to do so as if you're speaking the very words of God. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. Because what we mean by the kingdom of God is that time, that place, or that era where everything is exactly as God wants it to be. He goes on and says, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. If you're serving, don't draw attention to yourself. Instead, point it all back to Jesus. Point it all back to God. Let everybody know that that's the reason you're doing this thing. Everything you and I end up doing should be pointing to Jesus and glorifying him. Friends, the whole reason we exist as a church, this is our mission statement, but it's pretty simple. We exist to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus. Let me say it again. We exist to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus. So whether you are two years old down in the kids' ministry, whether you are a 27-year-old militant atheist and you just happen to wander in here or join us online one day, or you are 93 years old and you've been following Jesus for 75 years, wherever you're at on that spectrum, we want to help you follow Jesus, be in a growing relationship with Jesus. Some people, they're way back here in this part of the journey. we got to help them. Some people, you're way up here. We want to help you too. And we want to utilize all of our talents, all of our abilities, all of our resources, anything we can. We want to leverage so that the people around us can grow in a relationship with Jesus. I hope that you're asking yourself right now, what would it look like if I did that? What would it be like if I used all of my time, talent, money, resources, abilities, everything, so that other people might be led in a growing relationship with Jesus? Well, let me take a few stabs at it real quick. Maybe something like uh, you start a Bible study with some of your friends that that you spend a lot of time with. You look around and say, hey, we're all kind of interested in this, and I I don't mind scheduling it. I've got access to it. That's using your time, talent, and resources and abilities right there. You get everybody. You're a connector. You get everybody together. You have access to a place to meet. You can do that sort of thing. Or maybe you have a a background in fundraising and you leverage that background in fundraising to make sure that the local homeless shelter or the local food bank uh, never runs out of food for the homeless. You leverage that background to make sure that they never run out of uh, the ability to take care of the least or the most vulnerable in our community. Or maybe it's, it's something even simpler than that. You have a house, and you notice that there's a widow across the street who never has any visitors. And you start inviting her over to your house every Tuesday night to eat dinner with you and your family. Otherwise, she's going to eat alone every night of the week. I can't tell you what that would do in somebody's life if you could do that. If you've ever been lonely, if you've ever felt like people forgot about you, you know. That's like moving a mountain. And it's so simple. Any of us can do it. The question is, will we? Even even as a church, uh, we open up our doors here to to local nonprofits and and groups so that we can help them somehow know that that God loves them. We've got Narcotics Anonymous that, that meets on our church campus And we do that because we want these people who are fighting and struggling against addiction, we want them to know that God hasn't given up on them. And neither have we. Neither have the people of God. We're not giving up. We're rooting for them. It's little things like that. By the way, when you just give at church, you're doing this. You're helping lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus because you're taking these resources you have and you're making sure that we have a kids ministry and that we have a student ministry and we have... a People all around our church to make sure that these things happen and and people are ministered to. You're making sure uh, that we have discipleship programs. That we have facilities. Everything that we should be doing should be bringing the kingdom of God to earth. So let me say it this way so you'll remember. A good neighbor lives in the kingdom of God. You want to be a good neighbor Live in the kingdom of God and invite the people around you into that.
as Austin comes and, and he starts to play for a second, I want to invite you just to think for a moment. What would that, what would that look like in your life? If you lived in the kingdom of God in every moment. Remember, we're saying the kingdom of God is that time, that place, that era where everything is exactly as God wants it to be. What, if, what would it look like if you operated solely through the lens of love when it came to your neighbors around you? If you were in this kingdom of God? Let me pray for you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment? Lord, I thank you for today and I thank you for those, um, those who are here with us and those who are joining us online. I pray that you would give us the courage to live into the kingdom of God. To live in this kingdom and invite others into it. May we be people who live through the lens of love. May we be people who offer hospitality even when we don't want to. May we be people who serve others through our talents and our time and our abilities and our resources. May we be people who speak the very words of God, the life-giving words of, of God to those around us. May we live as if the future is already present in us. And may that bring many daughters and sons to Jesus. Amen.